Hello everybody, my name is Marcus Baskerville, head brewer and co-owner of Weathered Souls Brewing Company. So we're gonna go through the process of today of brewing great stouts and running through the Black is Beautiful recipe as well. We've been open for a little over four years, right here in the heart of San Antonio. We specialize over a different array of beers, everything from your classic styles all the way to the heaviest of stouts. And we also have a very nice barrel aged program here. Weather Souls was originally started by me and my business partner, Mike Holt, over a little conversation of beer, meeting actually working for a previous brewery together. So here we are now. We'll run you through a different couple of processes as far as how to brew stouts, why we typically go through the route we do with our recipe building, some of the processes, procedures, and techniques for brewing stouts, and some of the fun additional stuff that we do as well. Black is Beautiful was an initiative originally started here in San Antonio by Weathered Souls. There was a few different catalysts that led to the creation of the Black is Beautiful initiative. One was my drive on the way to Dallas to go brew with some friends at Turning Point. And during that, I was listening to a podcast that featured Brianna Taylor's mom. Listening to that podcast had a lot of heartfelt information dealing with kind of just the fact that I'm a father of two young girls and you look at some of these instances that have been happening across the US and it's something that really hits home, something that can happen to you or a family member or anything like that. So what the initiative is, was a call to breweries to participate in a collaborative effort to brew an imperial stout recipe and then donate 100% of those proceeds to charities, organizations, foundations that contribute to equality, inclusion, diversity, and police brutality reform. So far, we've had magnitude of people involved themselves within the initiative. We've had 1,200 different breweries involved, uh, all 50 states and over 23 countries. This has actually transcended beyond beer. We have distilleries participating, wineries, coffee roasters, and even some other service industries as well. So to see the tremendous support through the brewing industry has been an amazing thing, as we would never think that we would see 1,200 different breweries involve themselves with the stout recipe. It's been a, an amazing journey so far. And so dealing with the initiative, uh, we've been able to move a ton of commerce in support of these different foundations and organizations. For us, we've donated to locally to the Hunter Black Men of San Antonio. The Hunter Black Men of San Antonio is a organization that supports young males out of high school, out of juvenile hall and things of those nature, and basically guides them across the right path in creating job opportunities for them, trades for them, and the ability to keep them out of trouble. So to see different organizations be supported by this initiative and even going into some of the things like Humanize Your Hoodie, the NAACP, a lot of people have shown their support for the Michael Jackson Foundation that was created by Brooklyn Brewing. So to be able to see some of those different things and the money that's being moved and the involvement is great as far as this initiative and hopefully we could definitely keep pushing it forward. Well, let's bring you over into why you guys are all here today and that's brewing stouts. So Black is Beautiful, obviously, for the original recipe was a stout. Originally, we wanted to create something that was more against the traditional American style stout versus some of the heavier body pastry style stouts that you're kind of see as far as the popularity goes right now. I basically wanted to bring to light a style we don't see too often anymore and kind of have that kind of resurgence. But today we are actually going to be doing kind of a hybrid between the two as this is our normal base stout recipe. So you're going to see some of those traditional brewing styles as far as American stouts, but some of the fun things that we do for our pastry style stouts as well. For us here at Weather Souls, we kind of go through a multitude of different styles of stouts here. We do everything from the lighter stout styles to some of the medium, more mouthfeel that you'll see within like the Black is Beautiful American style stouts. But then we also do some of the higher ABV, heavier viscosity stouts as well. Stouts that fall anywhere between the lines of 12.5% to 14%, depending on the malt bill and different things like that. And we'll talk about some of that today as far as how to adjust your malt bill and adjust some of your processes to achieve these different style stouts. Um, as we go into the recipe building, we'll go over the base malts that are used, specialty malts, and then also some of the fun specialty dark malts we'll use to achieve some of the flavor characteristics that we use in our stouts as well. 
So for the stout that we're brewing today, uh, generally within the lines of the flavor profile, we use a lot of chocolate malt, and we also use a blend of dark chocolate malt as well to perceive some of these heavy chocolate uh, flavor characteristics. As you know, a lot of brewers these days uh, dealing with some of these higher ABV stouts aren't too much of a fan of roasted barley, so our roasted barley is actually very limited in the amount that we use within this beer, actually probably two pounds or less. And then also we're gonna go over some of the crystal malts that we use to achieve some of the other complex flavor profiles as far as some of the caramel and toffee flavors that you perceive in the beer as well. So let's start talking about the recipe. We're gonna go over basically how we build one of our stout recipes from the ground floor up, go over some of the malts that we use as far as these recipes go, kind of generalize, but depending on what type of style of stout, it's typically usually the same type of malt bill. You're just basically adjusting the amount of malts and percentages that you're using. So we'll cover basically what we're doing today with one of our little fun stouts and go over that process and let you guys know exactly what we're using. So first we're gonna start off with our base malt. Typical two row, we don't want anything typically with our stouts that are gonna be either too bready. Obviously you're not gonna to wanna to use a pills and malt with the stout dealing with those type of particular flavor profiles. But then even then dealing with the two row versus Pilsen type malt is also dealing with your mash temperatures. Typically with our stouts, we match at the higher end going up, even up towards 156. So being said that, it's typically not a good source to want to use anything besides two row. So that's typically what we stick with for our base malts. Going into some of the other malts that we use, uh, we do use some dextrin, our carapils. Dextrin malt is used as far as the body goes to contribute and also head retention. Because of the amount of dark malts and stuff like that, we wanna have a counteractive to what you're gonna use as far as your head retention and making sure that your stout has that nice frothy dark head that you want. Next, we go into our specialty malts. For us, typically we use a lot of crystals. We generally use Crystal 120 and also a blend of Crystal 60. Depending on the base overall flavor profile that you use, that's how you're gonna to wanna to treat those particular styles. For us, we use the 120 to contribute more of that toffee caramel flavor, and then the 60 to kind of round it out. Next up that we generally use is chocolate malt. So that fun chocolate flavor, roasted character that you get from chocolate malt. But then we go ahead and one up it. We also use dark chocolate malt within our stouts as well. The dark chocolate malt contributes a different type of flavor characteristic profile on top of that everyday chocolate flavor, kind of deepening the, the chocolate characteristics, the roast characteristics, something that you typically wouldn't see from using normal chocolate malt. The next malt is gonna be our black malt. So you're gonna see some differences in what brewers choose to use as far as the darker malts go within their stout base. Some brewers typically use care for three. Here we use black malt. The black malt that we use from proximity doesn't have a lot of bitterness characteristics, so it's not something that we're typically having to look for. Now, when you're going ahead and creating the recipe, you always wanna make sure that you're using the de-bittered black malt. A regular black malt can attribute some of those bitter characteristics that you get when you use too much. We use upwards up to 10% of black malt within our stouts. Some would say that's a lot, but we like to add that deep, dark black color to our stouts. And the black malt is typically where that color or SRM would come from. So we use it more so for the color aspect, not typically the flavor aspect of the beer. Most of the flavor aspect is gonna come from our chocolates and our crystal malts. And last but not least is going to be our black barley. So for us, we use very minimal amount of black barley. We're looking at stout recipes that can use anywhere upwards of 1,500 pounds of grain, and we're literally probably putting about two pounds of black barley within this beer. Uh, the reason why we use black barley is stylistically, we wanna make sure that technically you can call it a stout, but also we wanna keep some of that deep roasted smoke character out of our stouts. Because of this stout is typically used to adjunct with other flavor profiles and characteristics of that, you kind of want to go ahead and blend that out. And your stout recipes, especially when you start going into those heavier stouts, pastry stouts, it's all about balance. So you definitely want to eliminate any type of roasted character or smoke character that you're going to perceive within that beer because it's going to take away from those additional adjuncts and flavorings that you're going to use later. Typically, as far as our stouts, we go ahead and layer our stouts pretty much from base malts to our dextrin malt 
to our crystals, and then we finish off with our dark molds. The reason being is one, the way that your mash is set up, you wanna make sure that the initial amount of your base malt is in. What ends up happening a lot of times with your darker malts, depending on how you adjust and set your mill, the grist could be a little too fine for particularly what you need for your recipe. So that's how you end up with those stuck mashes. So what we do is actually go ahead and adjust our grist after the fact we mash in our base malts so we can go ahead and make sure that those additional smaller kernels and grains don't clog up our system and we end up with stuck mashes during the mash. Because of the amount of grain and the heaviness of the mash bill, you definitely want to ensure that you're not getting stuck mashes. Those are not fun to deal with, especially with the amount of flaked oats. Oh, we almost forgot flaked oats. So we use also flaked oats in the mash as well. Your flaked oats contribute to your body and mouthfeel of the beer. So depending on what type of stouts you're brewing, the percentages are gonna change. Dealing with the lighter body style stouts, you're obviously gonna use less of the darker malts, being so that you do not want, again, for your stout to become overly acidic, overly bitter, overly roasted, or overly smoky. So you're obviously gonna to want to limit those percentages when going into the smaller stouts. When going into the larger body stouts, that's where the fun begins as far as the recipe formulation and the different types of grains that you're gonna use. Again, for our heavier style stouts, we're using upwards to 10% of black malt. We're using anywhere from eight to 10% of chocolate malt, and we're using anywhere from about four to 5% of crystals. Uh, being said that, our base malt is usually around the 62 to 65% range, and dealing with that, that's gonna ensure that you're getting a full body high ABV stout, but then also with that balance of percentages, depending on what type of yeast and some of the steps that we'll talk about later with fermentation, it'll ensure that your stout actually ferments all the way out. Also within your mash before milling in, we do use a heavy load of rice holes within the mash. Rice holes act as an extra filter for your beer while running through your mash uh, to ensure and help with not achieving any type of stuck mash. So for us, dealing with about the ratio, we'll use about 30 pounds worth of rice holes for one of our 15 to 1600 pound batches of stout. So the gravity that we're shooting for today is actually on the higher spectrum. Typically, again, we do stouts anywhere that will go from gravity levels of, uh, let's do this for home brewers. So anywhere from 1090 to about 1160. So today we'll actually be shooting for a stout around the 1130 range. So super high ABV. We're hoping that with the fermentation process that will end up with about a 12 and a half to 13 percent stout. So dealing with our mash, we go ahead and use a few different things within our water profile. Here we treat water 100 percent to the style that we're brewing it. Typically for a stout, what you want to look for is the higher calcium levels that can kind of contribute to the hardness of water and then also a balance within the acidity of your beer as well. But typically, we shoot for a pH of about anywhere from 525 to 530 within the mash, dealing with our stouts. The way that you want to adjust that for us is we're using a lot of lactic acid to do that. But then also, again, that's where you want to look at some of the bitter and dark malts that you use as well, because that can also affect the acidity of your mash. And so that's something that you want to adjust within your recipe when working on your water profile. Depending on what type of stouts, obviously those finishing levels are going to be a little bit different. For us, when we look at some of the lower ABV stouts, we want those to finish on the drier end, anywhere between about 10, 20 and lower. When we're looking at some of the stouts like Black is Beautiful, obviously that's going to be around that like 10, 30-ish range. Dealing with some of our high ABV stouts, obviously you want to have that balance of ABV, the balance of sweetness, and the balance of the beer all around. For us, typically we can get our stouts to finish at a around that 1038 to 1042 range, which provides us with enough dryness within the beer, but a lingering res residual sweetness that overall balances the finished product that kind of blends well with additional flavorings or adjuncts that you might end up adding to the beer later on. So there's always new malts, different grains that are coming out and available to you. Like stated, a lot of brewers like to use, for instance, as far as their black malts go, because it has a very low amount of bitterness to it, is the Carafa 3. 
Anytime that you want to go ahead and use additional or different ingredients, it's always best to go ahead and taste those grains, taste those ingredients to see what they taste like and how they might possibly contribute to your beer. Always you can grind up a little bit within your hand, smell it, taste it. And there's the whole method of creating teas, right? You can go ahead and steep some of these grains within water and that will create a base flavor profile for you to be able to look at some of the blending that you'll be able to, to utilize as far as your recipe building goes. Dealing with stouts, and especially stouts that we're known for here, are the heavier, viscous, thick, chewy mouthfeel. So that's something that you also want to look at as far as your recipe building. And also, there's a few other underlining things that can contribute and assist with that. For us, dealing with our mash bill, obviously, it's maximizing our mash ton. So for us, a 10-barrel batch, we're using anywhere between 16 to 1,700 pounds of grain to achieve a 13 14% stout within one batch. So this is kind of what you call double mashing, right? You're extending the process, creating a concentrated wort, and then boiling it down. For us, we add a decent amount of flaked oats to our beer. So anywhere between four to 5% of flaked oats, that's gonna help with your mouthfeel. Something else that's gonna contribute to your mouthfeel of your beer is also your mash temperature. So dealing with a lot of different type of styles, you know, that your mash temperature can contribute to either residual sweetness or dryness or dealing with the amount of sugars that you're gonna pull. For us, we mash in on the higher spectrum for our larger body stouts. We mash at anywhere between 155 to 156 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're looking at about 173 degree strike water. Within that, that water is basically going to pull different sugars out that will create more of a full body beer. Something that we also look into and that we'll talk about later is your boil and how long you boil for. Going into the boil obviously can contribute to your mouthfeel and viscosity as well. And that's something that we'll discuss later along with the brew day. For us, we do anywhere from a six to eight hour boil dealing with some of our heavier stouts, our higher ABV stouts to create that mouthfeel and viscosity that you want to go along with the ABV. Now that we're done talking about the grain, let's move back to the brew stand and we'll take a look at the mash and some of the things that are going on currently. So now we're moving into the sparge process. Typically with our mashes, dealing with stouts, we actually extend our mash a little bit longer than your typical mash. So typically, usually for starch conversion, you know, you're looking at 60 minutes. For stouts, because of the higher amount of sugars that we're extracting out of the grain, we typically do anywhere from a 70 minute to a 75 minute mash. After our mash in, we went through a quick Vorloff just to make sure that we have a clear product moving over to the kettle. And then we start our sparge process. Because of the amount of wort that we initially have off of the mash, the sparge is actually a lot less than what your typical sparge is. So looking at today, we're about to transfer over about 585 gallons worth of wort. Then that, you're actually gonna be sparging about maybe 125 to 150 gallons of water, depending on. Because of the concentrated wort that you already have within the kettle, you actually do not have to sparge as long as you normally would need to to extract all of the additional sugars that you would in the normal process of brewing. Um, within our beer, we actually start our boil kettle after the first 25 gallons are moved over into the kettle. The reason behind the quick turnaround of turning on our jackets is to create caramelization at the bottom of the kettle with some of the residual wort that's already moved over. Dealing that is gonna enhance some of those caramel, those toffee, some of those chocolate flavors that we love so much within our stout. So doing that early on can contribute to some additional flavors that you normally wouldn't see if you didn't kick on your jackets until later in the brewing process. For our boil process, we typically use a few additional sugars as well. Again, with stout of this magnitude, the high ABV, you wanna create a thick viscous body for this beer. Uh, within so doing that, we also add the addition of maltodextrin. Maltodextrin uh, pretty much is a non-fermentable sugar, but what it does is it enhances the body of the beer tenfold. It's going to create some additional chewiness to the beer, some additional viscosity that you normally wouldn't see under normal boil conditions. To also enhance the mouthfeel, we typically do anywhere of a boil between six to eight hours, depending on what type of stout we're brewing. For some of those lower ABV stouts, obviously you don't need as long as a boil, a 60 minute boil will suffice. Even going into things like Black is Beautiful where you want a medium kind of mouthfeel, a medium viscosity, you're only gonna typically look at about two to three hours. But for our big body, more higher ABV stouts, we're gonna look at longer boils. Those longer boils attribute to more mouthfeel to the beer, but then also you're basically boiling off 
more of that wort, creating more of a concentrated beer. So within that, you're basically gaining EBV points the more that you boil this beer off. Now you are obviously going to lose yield doing this, so that might not be the best method if you're doing very small batches. So you might need to batch more than once to achieve the amount of yield that you actually want. But for us, moving over about 15 barrels of beer and achieving anywhere between 11 to 12 barrels is typical for what we would do on our normal stout days. So dealing with maltodextrin and the addition of additional sugars, I guess it really depends on how long of a boil you're doing. For us, because we want these sugars to fully dissolve, we're adding them an hour left within the boil. That gives a, a full hour for those sugars to melt within our boil kettle and actually dissolve so we're not ending up with any type of clumps of sugar. Because of the large batches that we're doing, we're using anywhere between 50 to 100 pounds of maltodextrin within this beer to create that body that you want. The beer today that we're doing will use about 100 pounds of maltodextrin to get that mouthfeel that you want. Additional ingredient that we also use within this is Belgian candy syrup. Belgian candy syrup is something that is typically used within the stout process. But for us, depending on what SRM of candy syrup you use, you're also able to achieve different flavors within this. For us, we use D90. D90 contributes to some additional caramel and additional flavor notes, vanilla flavor notes, that you will go ahead and get within the beer by adding this within the boil. For the candy syrup, we actually add the candy syrup within the last 15 minutes of the boil, typically with your yeast nutrients. Always make sure that you add your niche nutrients to your boil. Dealing with these high ABV stouts, you wanna make sure that you have enough stuff within this beer to chug along and make sure that your yeast does what it needs to do to finish out your product. You don't wanna end up with too much residual sugar in your stout batch after fermentation with your yeast crapping out before it's actually finished. So for us, we typically set our boil time limits, but it can also change depending on how much your beer has evaporated over that time. You also wanna monitor the levels of what your level is within the kettle because time isn't always gonna be subjective to what your beer actually needs at that point. For us, we'll start around a six hour boil and we'll take a look at the yield at that point. And then if we need to adjust, we can go ahead and adjust from there. For you guys at home, obviously look at your levels and the yield that you guys have within your kettle, and that's kind of going to let you know where you need to be. Also doing gravity checks along the way will end up assisting you as well. Knowing exactly what your ward is at during the boil can also achieve that to where if you already have reached your starting gravity, uh, you can end the boil a little bit early. But for us, we'll start at six and then we'll see where we need to go from there. So typically there's different non-fermentable sugars that you can use within your boil. You have your maltodextrin and your lactose. For lactose, lactose typically adds more of a sweeter profile on the back end. It does provide some creaminess, but to me it doesn't attribute too much to the mouthfeel. But then also in 2021, a lot of people are lactose intolerant, including myself. So for us, we go ahead and use the latter, which is the maltodextrin. For maltodextrin, it doesn't provide any type of flavor aspect to it, but what it does is provide that body that you typically want for your stouts, especially when you look at the higher ABV, the more thicker stouts that you see with some of the, the fun pastry stuff that you currently see out in the market. So now that we're running to the end of the mash, a few next steps to go ahead and take before we get to a boil. From here, typically for us dealing with stouts, uh, we do about a 70 minute mash. The reason for the 70 to 75 minute mash, because of the large amount of malt bill that we're using here and the size of the grist, we want to be able to extract as much of the sugars out as possible. So a typical starch conversion can happen within 15 and 20 minutes, depending on what type of beer you're brewing. But for the stout, we want to make sure that we're doing a longer mash run to ensure that we're extracting all of those little bitty sugars out. For us, we typically also do a very minimal sparge because of the amount of concentrated wort that we're producing during the mash. So say for instance, we're transferring over currently about 535 gallons worth of wort into the kettle. We used roughly about 545 gallons of water or liquor in the uh, mash. So because of that, we do very minimal as far as the sparge. Because of that concentrated wort, you're able to move that over with very minimal additions of water being added to your beer. Also something that you wanna look at when producing these higher ABV and thicker body stouts is once you've moved over a few gallons, for us, we move over about 25 to 30 gallons of wort. Once that 25 to 30 gallons of wort has been moved over to our kettle, then we go ahead and kick those jackets on. 
The reason behind that is we want to create some caramelization, melanoiding within that wort. You're going to get additional concentrates of caramel, that toffee, that deep dark chocolate that you want within that flavor profile. And starting your jackets early and creating that melanoidin reaction is going to assist in that process. Depending on what type of stout you're producing, your boil rates are going to change. Because of the stout that we're producing today, with the higher ABV and thicker mouthfeel, we're going to shoot for anywhere between six to seven hours. That amount can change, especially if you're monitoring the evaporation rates, if you're monitoring your starting gravity. So at home, obviously, that's something that you want to monitor and continue throughout the entire brew day. Once you've achieved your starting gravity, then you can go ahead and cut your boil. But for us, typically, to reach the quantity that we want want to achieve within our fermenter, we go ahead and create anywhere from a six hour boil and then start checking gravity after that. If it seems like we've evaporated too much beer, then obviously we'll do some gravity checks just to ensure that we're still within the range of our starting gravity. But typically the longer the boil, the more you're going to evaporate and the thicker your beer is going to end up being in the long run. So dealing with the sugars, outside of the sugars that you extract within our malt, we actually add a few different sugars to our boil. Within our boil, when we get towards the end, probably within the last hour or so, we go ahead and add our maltodextrin. Up anywhere between about 1.5% to 2% maltodextrin to the boil, depending on what we're trying to achieve. Today, we're going ahead and brewing a thicker beer, so we're going to use about 100 pounds of maltodextrin within our boil. So we're sitting around the 2% range. But within that, the maltodextrin is going to contribute to more mouthfeel, more body to the beer. I mean, it is unfermentable, so it is not going to contribute to the overall final gravity of your beer. It bumps up your starting gravity. So that is something that you want to look for when building your recipe to contribute and make sure that when adding this maltodextrin, that it doesn't offset the balance of your recipe. You don't want to end up with too much residual sweetness from the maltodextrin or whatever additional sugars that you end up using. We chose to use maltodextrin over lactose. Lactose tends to add a little bit of creaminess to the beer. It's also a non-fermentable. But me being lactose intolerant and a lot of people these days, we typically try to shy away from using lactose as for us, it doesn't contribute to anything that we actually need within the finished product. One final sugar that we use within the boil of our stout is Belgian candy syrup. We actually use D90. And what D90 does is contribute some additional flavors to the beer in your finished product. And so for us, it contributes some additional flavors of vanilla, caramel, but it can also contribute some molasses too, depending on when you add it within the boil and how much you use. For us in a typical batch, we do use an entire 50 pounds within our boil. And for that, it's gonna give us a little bit of some vanilla and a little bit of caramel in the finished product. As far as adding that into the boil, we typically add that within the last 15 minutes. Now you are gonna see different Belgian candy syrups that you can use at different levels. We've used all the way up to D180. Within the D180, you're gonna get more of that molasses and deep, dark syrup type character. So just be aware of what level of syrup that you're using, the different type of flavor profiles that it can contribute to the beer. Even with the D90 that we typically use, some say that you can get some notes of marshmallow as well. So depending on what you wanna use, you're gonna get some different notes, but I do suggest adding the last 15 minutes of the boil. So as far as our Belgian candy syrups and how they contribute, those raise starting gravity, but then also that does ferment out. So there is a balance between that and any additional sugars that you're going to use. If you're gonna use maltodextrin, you wanna make sure that you're creating a balance of those percentages so your beer doesn't dry out too much, and or if you're using too much maltodextrin, your beer doesn't finish enough. There is a balance within it. Typically for us, we're using about 1% of the Belgian candy syrup and about 2% of maltodextrin that creates a well fine balance for what we use here at Weathered Souls. As far as hops, we use a very neutral hop when it comes to our stouts. Again, because of the flavor profiles that we want attributed to the stout within itself, we want that hop characteristic to be kind of muted. We want just enough in there to where it is not overly contributing any type of flavor profile or bitterness from your actual hop profile. So for us, we use Cascade. For about a 15 barrel batch of stout, we're using around about five pounds of hops. So we actually keep our IBUs pretty low when it comes to our higher ABV stouts from anywhere from 25 to about 30 IBUs. We also, in the addition of the boil, add 
yeast nutrients. So whatever your normal yeast nutrient is, is fine, but you wanna make sure that we're adding any additional help that we can to this beer. Because of the high starting gravity, we wanna make sure that our yeast is able to finish out in a timely manner and not contribute any off flavors. So because of the high ABV, we typically go ahead and add some yeast nutrient about the last 15 minutes of our boil. Well, for our hop additions, typically the hop addition is actually at the beginning of the boil. We do a 60 minute and that's it. It's more so just to add that slight around of your bittering hop, but we actually let our malts play when it comes to the flavor profile and the flavor and taste of your beer. We actually let our malts do the talking when it comes to the flavor profile and the aroma of the beer. We want those dark malts and specialty malts to be the main contributing factor to what you're tasting within the product. We keep those hops minimal and we add those hops at your 60 minute mark versus the latter. When working with stouts, there's obviously a level of balance that you wanna create. There's so many contributing factors to the flavor profile of the beer that you have to actually literally balance out all of these ingredients to achieve what you want. So looking at your hops, for instance, if you're doing a higher ABV stout where you're doing anywhere between 10 to 12% of black malts, you obviously wanna limit your amount of hops being used. That's gonna to contribute to a lower bitterness to the beer, but also it's going to eliminate some of the additional flavors that you would get from your hops if you were to use more. You want those contributing factors to kind of balance out with the other dark malts, considering your chocolate malts and your dark chocolate malt, but then also round out with your specialty malts of the caramels that you're using as well. And typically adding those additional sugars again will also round out some of that flavor profile. So you think of the D90 as being an insinuation to the overall flavor profile that you're already creating with your malt bill and then using that maltodextrin to kind of round out that sweetness so you get that nice thick body but then it kind of rounds out with a very slight residual sweetness that melds well with your finished product so you're going to get all of those flavors up front you're going to get your caramel your dark chocolate a little bit of that lighter chocolate mouthfeel you're going to get some of your coffee roasts but nothing too bitter obviously because you've limited the amounts of hops and then you've also have used the debittered black malt instead of some of the latter. So all of that's gonna create a balance within your stout. So all of those ingredients can kind of work together to meld into one flavor. A brewing beer, there are some things that can go wrong. Dealing with some of the stouts, some of those off flavors that you can kind of perceive in some of them is too much smoke. For me, I don't really care for stouts that have a large amount of smoke or that ashy character that you sometimes get or some of that bitterness. So managing the amount of black malts that you're gonna use is gonna be one of the main focuses to managing this. Obviously limiting the amount of roasted barley or black barley is gonna limit that smoke and roasted character. That's why for us, we use about two handfuls in a full batch of beer. That's just more so to kind of technically call the style of stout but we don't want any of those flavor characteristics to take away from the balance of what you're normally gonna perceive, especially with adding additional adjuncts or flavors later on in the finished product. As far as the accurateness that you might receive or some of the additional acidity, obviously managing those black malts is where most of that is gonna come from, and also your chocolate malts. Your dark malts with using too much can bring some acrid and bitter flavors that you don't want within your stout. So managing those percentages to round out your overall profile is gonna be very important. For us, again, I wouldn't go over 10% when it comes to your black malt. I wouldn't go over probably seven to 8% dealing with chocolate malt. And I wouldn't go over probably a half a percent when it comes to your roasted barley. So when it comes to your dark malts and specialty malts, you always want to try to have the best practice of using fresh malts. You are going to notice a difference in some of the flavor profiles when using some of those older, dark character malts versus the more fresh ladder, especially when it comes to your chocolate malts. You get almost like a stale character when using some of those older malts. And then dealing with black malt, you get some of that kind of acridness as far as the malt goes, the more that it ages. If you're working with your local home brewer or even ordering grain online, please make sure that you guys are trying to get the freshest grain possible to work with these beers. Fresh grain is always gonna be better in achieving some of those flavor profiles that you're looking for when it comes to stouts. Going towards the end of the boil, obviously we have the third vessel here, so we go ahead and whirlpool. Whirlpooling just goes ahead and knocks out any of the additional particulates that might be within your beer after you're finished with your boil. If you don't have a whirlpool, you can always stir with your mass paddle or create some type of vortex within your kettle to assist with knocking those particulates out. 
So going into the fermentation stage and fermentation process of stouts, first is yeast selection. So for us, we actually use California Ale Yeast 001 by White Labs. This is a very neutral, easy to use yeast strain when it comes to stouts. It assinuates some of those deep dark chocolate flavors, some of those caramel flavors, but the most important part about it is it's able to handle those high ABVs. So with 001, you're gonna be able to finish out that stout around the final gravity that you want without having to add any additional enzymes to the beer. For us, we go with heavy oxygenation process at the beginning of transferring this beer into the fermentation vessel. So for us, we do anywhere from eight to 10 parts per million of oxygen. And this is basically to help your yeast along as far as creating a healthy environment for your yeast to be able to go ahead and process this large amount of sugar and process the large ABV. For us, we also do hit our stout with the second day of oxygen. So we are providing O2 on day two at about two, three parts per million for about 10 to 15 minutes. This is just to ensure that your yeast does have all the nutrients necessary to finish out the beer because typically having a starting gravity between 1120 to 1160 can give you some issues on a finished product. So to ensure that, you also want to make sure that you're double pitching yeast. For instance, on a, about a 15 barrel batch, we're using about roughly 40 barrels or four liters worth of yeast to go ahead and make sure that we're achieving that final gravity. Because of the amount of starting gravity, you want to make sure that you have enough yeast cells present so your yeast doesn't crap out and or strain itself and create off flavors. So please make sure that you are at least double pitching and or creating a yeast starter if you're at home to go ahead and make sure that your yeast has enough viability to ferment out the high ABV stouts. For us going into the tank, we typically push our stouts in at around 70 degrees. We do ferment at around 67 degrees and then towards the end of fermentation, after about seven to eight days, we start ramping up temperature to about 70. This is just to ensure that yeast has finished, that you have reached your final gravity and you've hit all your numbers at where you want to. But a typical fermentation range around 66 to 68 degrees is ample enough for your yeast to do what it needs to do as far as fermentation goes for your stouts. Along with using O2 and along with double pitching, another thing that can contribute to achieving your final gravity is obviously gonna be yeast nutrient. For us, we use the typical yeast nutrient tablets and we add those within the last 15 minutes of the boil. This just contributes to helping your yeast finish along and contributes to a healthy product in the long run. So please make sure that you are using yeast nutrient as well when producing these high ABV beers. It's typically, we do six to eight days of primary fermentation. At that point, we check our final gravity, which is normally almost complete at that point, but it's typically not. So from there, we slowly ramp up that temperature within our fermentation tank, usually up to anywhere between 70 to 72 degrees. Doing so that basically helps your yeast finish out. It creates a warmer environment for it to kind of dry out a little bit. And so you don't end up with too much residual sweetness and or a product that did not finish out. Typically for our stouts, they do ferment anywhere at a total of 16 to 21 days, depending on what the starting gravity was and what we're looking for for the final gravity. Again, with this stout, we're gonna sit somewhere between 1040 to 1045. And so that will typically be about 16 to 18 days for that beer to finish out. From there, we go ahead and start cold crashing. We move the beer to 33 degrees or as cold as you can get it. That helps that yeast fall out, come up with the finished clean product. And for us here at the brewery, we actually do biofine our beers. Because of the high ABV and also the viscosity of this beer, we wanna make sure that any particulates or residual yeast is actually falling out. We add an additional blast of biofine at the end of our fermentation to make sure that all of that yeast has moved through the beer and we have a clean finished product to package when it's ready. Dealing with our stouts, we actually just cold crash at once. Dealing with some particular styles and dealing with some yeast, it is smart to go ahead and crash down within steps. But we found here dealing with stouts, we haven't seen any noticeable difference in doing so. And so we actually just go from that typical 70 to 70 degrees, 33 to that 35 range, depending on how cold we can get it at the time. Typically it does take about 24 hours on our system for 
the cold crash to happen. So it is still giving it time to kind of cool down where it's not going to be drastic. But for us, there's no step process as far as the fermentation goes. It's just, you're gonna finish your primary fermentation and then go into cold crash. With the carbonation within the stouts and your finished product, typically we actually aim for the lower end carbonation. Because of the mouthfeel of these beers, we don't want them over carbonated. So typically for us, we're carbing at around 2.2. That gives us a decent amount of carbonation within the beer, but then actually leaves some of the body to be found from the actual product itself and not the actual carbonation. Plus having too high of a carbonation from stouts can actually take away from some of that flavor profile that you want. You wanna be able to taste those toffee notes, your chocolate notes within the product. And so having too high of a carbonation range can definitely hinder some of the flavor profile that you want in your finished product. Now that your stout is ready, you've reached your final gravity, let's look at some of the different things that you can do with the finished product. Here at Weathered Souls, we're known for a lot of the adjuncted stouts and some of the treated stouts that we do here. So for us, what we're more, I guess, known for would be coconut, for instance, right? So there's different ways to achieve that coconut flavor within your beer. For us, we actually use two types of coconut to achieve the flavor profile we want. Again, each of your ingredients contribute different flavor profiles depending on how it's treated, right? So you can toast coconut, you can use raw coconut, you can press coconut and use coconut water. There's multiple different things that you can do to achieve those different coconut flavors. And depending on how you treat each of these different adjuncts, they're gonna contribute different flavors. So for instance, we use toasted coconut and then also use desiccated coconut. What desiccated coconut is raw coconut in basically powder form. What that raw coconut does for us is contribute to the base of that coconut. It gives that raw coconut flavor, that deep coconut flavor that you really want within your beer. And then we use the toasted coconut to offset that. Toasted coconut is more about the aroma and the sweetness. So for us, we use both of them to contribute to two different flavor characteristics within that beer itself. You're gonna use that toasted coconut to achieve your sweetness within it, your aroma that you're always looking for as far as that coconut goes. And then the desiccated coconut is basically gonna round out that beer with the flavor profile that you want, the deep coconut flavor that you would normally get as if you were to chew into a bite of actual coconut. There's also other little fun ingredients that we use anywhere from cacao nibs. For cacao nibs, we love toasting cacao nibs. There, and there's, again, different ways that you could process them. There's baking, there's just sanitation. People have let them soak within vodka at the home brewing level or bourbon at the home brewing level. For us, we like toasting them. Toasting them to us brings out and insinuates some of those additional chocolate notes that you would normally get, but it also contributes to the flavor profile as well. Toasting your cacao nibs instead of the latter is actually gonna bring out a lot more of those flavors in the finished product. And so when you're adding them into the beer, it contributes to more. And we actually, as far as the quantity goes, we can get a little heavy with some of these adjuncts. For a, say a typical five gallon batch of stout, we would probably use around a half a pound of cacao nibs. So we'll say for about two barrel batch, we're using about two pounds. For coconut, for instance, that can get even crazier. For coconut, we're using anywhere for a two barrel batch from 25 to 50 pounds. Something that's also important as far as your adjuncts is making sure that they're able to reach all levels of your product, right? So for us, what we do is we recirculate our ingredients, typically from anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. So what this does is help assinuate those ingredients within your product and help bring out some of those flavor profiles. So for us, for coconut, typically we recirculate anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. Another fun ingredient that we like playing with is coffee. You'll notice that we have a slew of coffee beers that we've done here at Weathered Souls. Coffee is typically added coarse ground, and we can use anywhere from two to three pounds per barrel, depending on what type of coffee. For us, we like typically using a medium roast coffee, nothing that's too abrasive or too roasted. You wanna still be able to pull out some of those additional flavors that you would normally get within your coffee, depending on the origin of the coffee and where you're getting it. They're gonna have different flavor profiles. So for us, we wanna highlight those within the coffees that we use because a lot of the coffees that we use are single origin and from different countries that you're more than likely not gonna be able to buy on your store shelves. So it just doesn't wanna be that Folgers characteristic to your beer. You wanna be able to achieve some of those other flavor profiles that you might get. There's coffees 
coffees that contribute blueberry. We had a geisha coffee that contributed green tea notes. So depending on what type of coffee you're using is obviously going to be as far as the amount that you're going to use, but then how you want to add it. Again, typically you want to use somewhere between a light or medium roast for your coffee. That dark roast to me attributes too much acidity and too much bitterness in the long run. And so the lighter is a little bit better. And something that's also important as far as your ingredients go is always start light. For us, we've had it tried and true as far as the amount of ingredients that we want to use for a finished product. But something that you can't ever do is take away from ingredients. And that's something that I learned as a home brewer early on. So again, when you're working with new ingredients or working with ingredients that you're typically not using within your product, always start light because you can add more. You can't never take away. Typically for us, it depends what ingredient it is if we're going to start low or high. For ingredients that we typically use all the time, we pretty much have those ratios kind of mapped out. So for those cacao nibs, vanilla beans, coffee, coconut, typically we stay around the same rates that we normally use unless we're trying to attribute one flavor characteristic more than the other. So say for instance, we just did a barrel aged coconut beer. Because we wanted the coconut to be the main highlight of the beer, we actually doubled the amount of ingredients that we typically use. So again, for a two barrel, it could be in about anywhere between 25 to 50 pounds. For that beer, we used actually about 58 to 60 pounds of coconut, recirculated it for two days, and then added another 50 pounds of coconut and recirculated it for two days. And that contributed some different notes that you normally wouldn't see if you were just to go with your base amount. But when it comes to some of those ingredients that you can't take away from, like peppers or spices, those are definitely something that you kind of want to start light with. Even going a little lower than your typical ranges, 15 to 20 percent wise, because dealing with some of those ingredients, they can contribute some off flavors or typical flavors that you're not going to want. Say you use too much clove or nutmeg within your beer. And that's something that you typically can't balance out or fix. And so starting on the lighter end of that spectrum is going to help you out and is going to contribute to a, a better finished product in the long run. So dealing with particular ingredients for us, because we do have a hot back when adding those ingredients to said beer, we go ahead and add that within the hot back. And so we don't need bags. Adding things directly into tanks can be very painful sometimes. So I do suggest using muslin bags or pantyhoses to assist you with that. Definitely with things like coconut, cow nibs, even vanilla beans if you're chopping them. You don't want those adjuncts or ingredients to interfere with your bottling or kegging or however you're doing the finished product. Also, depending on what type of beer that you're producing and what flavor notes that you want to produce, sometimes you want to take out one ingredient before the other or add in an ingredient before the other. And so being able to bag those makes it a little bit easier to go ahead and pull those ingredients out of your fermenter if you need to at a later date. So typically with the addition of adjuncts is going to be how long do I leave it in there? For us, it kind of depends on what adjunct it is and what flavor profile you're trying to achieve from that. Uh, but typically, it's not that long. For the addition of coconut, typically we're only leaving a beer on coconut for around two to three days to achieve that coconut characteristic that we want. Uh, looking at vanilla beans, especially because of how expensive they are, we typically let those sit longer. Um, our vanilla bean process is like what many others are is typically letting it soak within bourbon for a day or two to go ahead and sanitize them and then adding the whole lot in basically because at this point you've created a tincture that you can use everything within that beer to get some of those flavor profiles. And then looking at some of the additional ingredients that you can use, cacao nibs, obviously that's something that can be a few days depending on how much chocolate you want. For us, Typically, it's around 48 to 72 hours. The big one that you do not want to have a long contact time for is coffee. Coffee can contribute some flavors to your beer that you do not want over a long length of time. Think when you're adding coffee and cold steeping it. For us, we cold steep. So we're adding our coffee at 33 to 30 degrees within the tank. With adding this coffee, think of it almost as creating cold brew. You're cold steeping this already processed coffee and extracting those flavors from it. You let it sit too long and you're going to start achieving some of those flavors that you don't want. You know, the green pepper, some of the acidity that you don't want out of the coffee. Some coffees even can attribute to some bitterness. And so for us, the max, the max that you should add coffee is probably about 48 hours. For us, it's a little under that, but we have noticed that you can get away with about 48 hours without having any noticeable difference to the flavor profile that you're looking for. 
Looking at some of the additional flavors and adjuncts that you can use, something that we've also done here is using the addition of fruit puree or fruits. Uh, when doing this, um, you want to make sure that you're adding your fruits at a point within the fermentation for you to create something called re-fermentation. Do not add your fruits at the very end of fermentation, typically because this will relieve residual sugars within the beer that can create re-fermentation in your bottles, kegs, or however you decide to package your beer. To eliminate that and make sure that your beer is actually fermenting all the way out, for us, we go ahead and add that fruit a few days within the initial fermentation process. So once our beer has gotten about halfway through fermentation is when we add our additions of fruit. For us, we've gone anywhere from, let's see, a 10 barrel batch from 150 pounds to almost 300 pounds of fruit. Uh, but something that I've noticed when using fruit within stouts is, again, it's all about balance. So you don't wanna use too much and then not be able to take away from it. Always start the lower end of the spectrum, taste after a day or two, especially while fermentation is still going, and then you will know if you need to add any more. Within that, you wanna make sure when adding some of these additional ingredients that do have residual sugars, that you're letting them fully referment all the way out so you don't end up with bottle bombs, can bombs, or, or anything like that. For us dealing with fruits for stouts, it's typically going to be the darker berry fruit. So we've done cherries, blueberries, raspberries. Typically we try to stay within that flavor profile range, things that are gonna kind of remind you of that jammy aspect versus using some of the lighter stone fruits and things like that. To me, it would seem a little too obscure within the stout profile. Now you might want to get creative and, and try something different. But for us, we're going to stay towards those jammy type of fruits that are going to provide that flavor that you can accent with chocolates or even peanut butter, which we've done in the past as well, to give those kind of a highlighted flavor on top of the stout in itself. Have fun with your adjuncts. We try to create different flavor profiles that mimic a lot of the desserts that we've loved as kids, cereals that we've loved as kids, ice cream. You know, we're creating a La Manganada beer this week just to highlight San Antonio and the mango dessert that everybody loves so much. Uh, so get creative with your adjuncts. Think about those different flavor profiles that you like as kids, your favorite candies, your favorite pastries, your favorite cakes, different things like that. And think about those flavor profiles when you're creating those type of beers. Say, for instance, you wanted to create a German chocolate style beer. Obviously, those are going to have your notes of chocolate, vanilla and coconut. So you want to be able to achieve that profile based on that. So for us, for instance, to achieve that profile, obviously you want the coconut and the chocolate to be very much into play. Those are obviously the first flavors that you're gonna taste upon tasting a German chocolate cake. So for us, it would be creating a balance of the two of them to where they're almost as noticeable with one another or interchangeable. So you're gonna use that heavier amount of chocolate, you're gonna use that heavier amount of coconut than what your typical add-ins might be and then use your vanilla at a minimal aspect because the vanilla is gonna be a secondary ingredient. You don't want it to overshadow the chocolate and the coconut. So I would even say using as less as maybe 0.15 pounds worth of vanilla per barrel. That way it can provide a decent amount of back sweetness, a decent amount of vanilla character if you're looking for it, but it's gonna to continue to let that coconut and chocolate shine in the long run. For us, dealing with adjuncts, it can change your initial recipe and or grist or malt bill. For us, again, it's about the balance and creation. So when you're thinking about those recipes and you know what adjuncts you're going to be using, think about that when it comes to the overall creation of your recipe. I'm using sweet ingredients. Obviously, you don't want to create a stout that's going to have too much residual sweetness. Or if you're doing a beer that's going to be on the more drier end of the spectrum, using ingredients that are going to give that perceivable sweetness might be beneficial to that beer. Um, so always look at the full range of your recipe from beginning to end when creating these because again, it's all about the balance and creating something where you're gonna be able to taste every single note that you provide within a beer. Something that's important when adding adjuncts is you see those beers where there's additional adjuncts and or flavors that are listed, but you're not able to achieve or actually taste any of those flavors. So something that you wanna do is making sure that you create that balance within your recipe itself, but then even the flavor ingredients, knowing that some ingredients might be more prominent than others just from the gate. So using that balance and making sure that you're tasting those ingredients before adding to them to your beer so you know what they're tasting like will help you achieve those flavor profiles that you're really looking for. Depending on what ingredients that you're using can also contribute to loss of beer. There are some ingredients that obviously absorb more of your beer that will take away from your finished product. So when you're using fruit purees, 
fruits. You're using heavy adjuncts like coconut, even sometimes cacao nibs if you're adding them freely. They can soak up some of that beer and or take away some of your finished product. So always take that into account with your initial grain bill and your initial volumes of beer that you push into your fermentation tanks to account for the losses that you may have with some of the adjuncts that you use. Something that we're more known for here at Weather Souls is the use of barrels. We have grown to garner a wide selange of different barrels over the course of the year. Barrel aging beer can be fun because you're adding additional flavor profiles to your beer without having to add any additional adjuncts. Depending on what type of spirit barrel that you're using, they can contribute different flavors. So we'll look at bourbon barrels, for instance. Bourbon barrels are going to contribute notes of, you can be anywhere from oak tannins, vanilla, caramel. It all depends on what was housed within the spirit barrel before. For us, we go ahead and have made a relationship with a lot of local bars and restaurants and barrel groups. This does is kind of provide us with barrels that nobody else will have the ability to get, which a lot of people know as single barrels or store picks. Single barrels and store picks, these were actually selected off of the main lot because they already contributed different flavors that your typical bourbon or whiskey wouldn't have off of the shelf. So for instance, our Sagamore store picks, or Eagle Rare store pick, or Forrester store picks, are all the fun stuff that we've been able to go ahead and get within the last couple of years. When adding your beer to barrels, that's something that you wanna think about in your actual recipe formulation. Because of being barrel aging and your beer sitting for long periods of time, there's things to think about as far as absorption. There's things to think about as far as mouthfeel. So typically for our barrels, we don't ever put any of our lower ABV stouts or lower mouthfeel beers within the barrels themselves. Typically because of the barrel age program that we've been able to garner, there are more of the viscous, thick, chewy stouts that we add into these barrels. And there's a few things that you wanna to do to prep your barrels before adding beer to them. The first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is inspect your barrel. Right, so you just received this barrel from a friend or a local distillery or you ordered it online. You wanna make sure that everything is on point as far as your staves goes, as far as the rings, you wanna make sure that there's no leaks. So something that we do here is we rehydrate our barrel before anything. Our HLT water is at 196 degrees. So we basically add that to our barrel, let it sit 30 minutes and make sure that there's no leaks. But then also 196 degrees does sanitize our barrel for us. At the homebrew level, what we suggest and what my suggestion would be is to add water at about 170 degrees. Within 30 minutes, you're able to pasteurize that barrel, make sure that it's sanitized, but then also ensure that you're not going to have any leaks or cracks or anything where you might lose your finished product. After you go ahead and rehydrate your barrel, go ahead and empty it and make sure that all water is out of the barrel. From here, what you wanna do is purge any additional oxygen. Because the barrel is a vessel that is open, it can be exposed to air, and there's obviously air with inside of this barrel that over time can ruin your beer. At the point after your initial fermentation, any addition of O2 is bad for your beer. So what we typically do is, is go ahead and purge these barrels. You're gonna purge with CO2, make sure that all of that oxygen is out and there's a nice layer of CO2 before putting your beer in. You're gonna fill your barrel up. I do suggest filling your barrel all the way. You can partially fill it, but over time, there is gonna be some oxidation involved with that headspace. So you wanna eliminate any additional headspace that you might have within the barrel, making sure that you're filling it. For us, we hard bung most of our barrels but at the home level, you can bung it and then use a sanitized airlock to make sure that any additional CO2 is out, doesn't expand your barrel or over time ruin your beer. You can always get creative and depending on what type of barrel you're gonna use, you're gonna get those different flavor profiles. For us here, the mainstay that we like using is bourbon. That bourbon profile to me is unmatched. We have done other things as far as rum. Rum, you're gonna get that sweeter character. Those are obviously great for coconut beers and vanilla beers. We've even done tequila. So it kind of just depends what type of end product that you want for your beer as far as what type of spirit barrel that you're gonna actually physically use. If you have the ability to have multiple barrels, one of the fun experiments that you can kind of get into is blending. Again, barrels contribute different flavor profiles and each barrel is gonna be different. You can buy five of the same barrels from the five same distillers and each one of those barrels may taste different than the next one. 
And so because that, there has been something created called blending. What blending is, is using different contributes, each barrel to one finished product. So one barrel may be more viscous than the other. Another barrel might have more notes of chocolate or vanilla. And so you can offset these barrels with other ones to kind of blend them together to achieve those flavor profiles that you want in the finished product. Just like for instance, we recently did a anniversary blend where that had, I think, three different stout barrels within it. And each one contributed a different flavor profile. One was super thick and viscous and had a nice mouthfeel. The other rye barrel contributed a slight spiciness and vanilla character to it. And then the barrel that we used to round it off just has so much deep oak tannin and vanilla and caramel notes in it that they just all blended well together to create one finished product. And so if you do have more than one barrel or even, I mean, a barrel and a clean beer, or a barrel and an adjunct beer. You can do some fun blending and creations, create different products and different beers within your own household to create different things that you might not normally have done otherwise. Probably the biggest do not that I've discovered dealing with stouts is do not rush your runoff. Dealing with rushing your runoff or using actually too much sparge water can contribute in a not so fun stuck mash. Stuck mashes are something that could typically happen with stouts because of the amount of grist that you're using and the amount of weight that's being pushed within your mash tun. So low and slow is the best method, almost like barbecue like. Low and slow is going to be your best method when producing stouts. Transfer your beer over slowly, sparge slowly, and ensure that you're not creating any type of vortexes or issues within your mash that might ends you up with a stuck mash. I've been part of brew days where stuck mashes have last anywhere from two to three hours and they're not fun. So when you start getting into these larger batches of beer, you definitely wanna make sure that you're doing things on the slower spectrum to make sure you're not reaching that point in your mash or even during the sparge. So as we kind of speak about recipe formulations and stouts and some of the things that you would do on the homebrew level, it kind of lets you reflect about my homebrew days. Before I became a professional brewer, homebrewed for about five and a half years. Uh, originally, I got into homebrewing as pure competition with my older brother. I have an older brother who's seven years older than me. And basically, he had got like one of those Mr. Beer kits. So the beer came out horrible. Within the range of that, it was like, okay, well, I could produce a better beer than you. We actually started brewing beer together. Within the course of that, I moved to San Antonio. So skipped out of California and moved to San Antonio. I took a promotion with my job at the time I was in banking. I actually got into a car accident the first week I was here and used the additional money that I got and upgraded my home brewing equipment. My wife at the time basically was notified as it hit my doorstep that I went with a brand new Blickman Systems. So within that, kind of like, hey, by the way, I spent $2,500 on a new brewing system. But for me, I always knew within my mind that at some point I wanted to be within a professional setting. So home brewing, first couple of beers really weren't that great. And then I started making beer that was palatable. Then I started making beer that was drinkable. And then I started drinking beer that I was like, hey, I'd rather have one of these than going out to the local bar. Upon doing that, especially if you have any want to become a professional brewer, I suggest taking your beers to breweries, bars, tap rooms, places to let people try your beer, give you real feedback, professional settings where people can give you advice on your product. I did that for about a year, bringing my beer here and there until a local brewery let me have a tap takeover. And I had four beers on tap and all four of those beers ended up tapping out the same day. Upon doing that, I kind of knew that, hey, like this might be something that I might be okay at. That particular brewery actually offered me an assistant brewing job after that tap out. So I still worked full time as a fraud manager, working anywhere from 50 to 60 hours a week, worked an additional 30 hours a week at a local brewery here in San Antonio. I kind of learned more so the do's and the don'ts of what not to do within the brew house. Kind of grew unhappy at some point because I didn't really have the ability to create like I wanted to, kind of like what I have the ability to do now. And so I ended up leaving. To be able to garner that experience early on definitely contributed to my overall passion as far as wanting to be a professional brewer, wanting to go into a brewery setting and eventually owning my own brewery. We kind of lucked out with the way that I ended up with the brewery. Typically it's not as easy as to get seed money or different things, especially for a brewery on my scale. I was lucky enough to meet an individual who believed in the passion that I have for beer, believed in the beer that I was producing, 
and basically we opened up with one other investor and here we are today. Dealing with Weather Souls, we have so many different array of beers. Our main focus has always been, it's all about the beer. You'll find that in the brew house on the wall itself. That was actually something that my brother came up with. We always wanted to make sure that our passion was towards the products that we were producing. Our passion was towards the customers that we were bringing in here and creating that atmosphere of family. The Weather Souls, we've been lucky enough to be garnered the best brewery within San Antonio three out of the four years that we've been open. And even some recent accolades behind Black is Beautiful and some of the other beers that we've released over the course of the last couple of years. Even at one point, Thrill is top 33 stouts in the world. So being able to achieve different notorieties like that has basically put us in the ability to have a little more popularity when it comes to some of the things that we do here locally within San Antonio. But it's always about fun, about blending ingredients, creating well done products and creating beers that are approachable, drinkable, but then also creating beers that are kind of off the realms of what you would normally see, but then giving you a, a sense of nostalgia with some of these pastry styles that we do. Like, hey, this reminds me of, you know, a cereal I used to eat when I was eight years old, or this reminds me of a dessert that I used to have, or that my mom used to make me. And so that's something that we've tried to build here, is that nostalgic aspect of people wanting to come here and try these beers and then feel a certain way. Hopefully that's something that you guys can translate to your homebrew products as well. Dealing with the stouts, something that has garnered us more within this last year has been the Black is Beautiful initiative. And that's why we kind of chose the name, this particular class, the Black is Beautiful and Brewing Stouts. Black is Beautiful has brought so much attention to the beer scene over the last year, but with the support of so many individuals in the beer scene as well, to see everybody rally together and join together and something that was so meaningful to us here at Weather Souls and just so many consumers and customers in general is amazing. We look at where we're at in 2021 and know that there could definitely be change. Dealing with Black is Beautiful, the beer itself was just the overall message and everybody else is the ones that are the individuals that are really moving this initiative along. And we chose to name this class because of overall the impact that Black is Beautiful has made over the last year. I do want to say thank you to all of the consumers, customers, and even the brewers who've gone ahead and have brewed this beer in support of equality and inclusion. Especially being a black brewer in the state of Texas, I'm the only black brewery owner and the only black head brewer in the entire state. So to see numbers like that and to see the rallying behind the Black is Beautiful initiative is nothing but short of amazing. We look at the amount of commerce that's been moved from breweries. You look at Stone, who's donated $56,000. You look at us, who's donated 50,000 locally. We've had about 400 responses for the 1,200 breweries that have participated and we're almost to $2 million within revenue that's been moved. So you look at the amount of money that's being moved between this and the support that the brewing industry has shown and garnered towards it that the brewing industry has made history. I don't think that we could ever look at any point within any realm of social justice that a individual service industry has contributed so much to diversity. And to be able to say that that's come from the brewing industry is a wonderful and proudful thing that we can do. And it's a very humbling thing, considering that it all started here. Well, I do appreciate everybody that has either sipped the Black is Beautiful beer, purchased it, brewed it, even just held the can within their hands and created that conversation and wanted to join the message. As we have discussed stouts over this lesson today, again, the Black is Beautiful recipe is available online at blackisbeautiful.beer. If you do choose to brew this beer, please think about contributing some type of donation to your local charity, foundation, or organization that supports inclusion and diversity. This is something that's very important, but within brewing that beer, you're only helping out in the long run and helping the initiative grow and be more successful. Please come visit us. We're here in San Antonio, Texas, I'm off of Bitters and West Avenue. We're only two exits away from the airport. So if you ever come to San Antonio, we're super close to where you've landed. You can also find us at weathersouls.beer, blackisbeautiful.beer. And then we're also on Facebook as Weather Souls Brewing, Instagram as Weather Souls Brewing Co., and even Twitter. So if you want to give us a follow and kind of see what we're up to, what beers we're releasing in the future, or some of the fun stuff that we have going on, please give us a follow.